Professor Teru. In this video, we're going to be doing three examples where we eliminate the parameter uh, in a system of parametric equations, thus converting it into rectangular form, and then sketching. Now, we're going to be looking at the sketches of uh, a graph that we get from a system of parametric equations, so we'll be highlighting the difference between uh, the graph of an equation that is in a rectangular form, where we have y in terms of x, and how it differs from a graph that is created from a system of parametric equations. We're going to be doing three examples, so in the description you'll find timestamps to jump ahead. We're going to do a lot of emphasis of um, reviewing our trigonometric skills uh, in this equation, because the third example, um, for a lot of years, I just taught one way, and now I'm starting to realize, uh, and with many problems, there are more than one way of solving them. So we're going to do a lot of uh, uh, review of our trig skills, and to let us see that the more tools in your toolbox, the more concepts that you learn uh, and remember through your journey of mathematics, uh, the more flexibility, the more creativity you'll have um, available to you as you go deeper into your studies um, and work with more complex situations. So the eliminating of the parameter. Now, here we don't have any trig involved with these first uh, two, this first system of two equations. So we can recall on our skills from algebra one uh, where we solved um, systems of equations when you were finding where linear functions uh, crossed, uh, crossed or touched by substitution, which means that we see that both in our variable of x and y, uh, we're tracking both of these movements, horizontal and vertical, based on a parameter of t, and we want to eliminate that. So that means that that's going to be our pathway between getting y in terms of x, or y equals some math involving x. We're going to go through that variable of t. We're going to, let's see here, put this down. We're going to pay attention to our equation where we have x, and what I want to do here is convert this or solve this for t, write t in terms of x, so that we can then bring out uh, this variable in t and, and, and replace it with an expression that involves x. So we're going to add both sides by 5, divide both sides by 3 to isolate the t, and there we go. So now that we have that t is equal to both x plus 5 over 3, and it's part of the expression or equation that is in terms of or, or set equal to y, we're going to use that technique of substitution and bring together these two equations, one for x and one for y. And write y is equal to 9 times what we have as t, which is x plus 5 over 3. And that was t squared, and I'm using substitution, or parentheses, when I do the substitution. Uh, which is always a really good idea. Simplifying this, we have y is equal to 9 times x plus 5 squared over 9. Our multiplication and division of 9 cancels out, and we see that we have y is equal to x plus 5 squared. Now, sometimes when you're given a system of parametric equations, you can kind of see or predict what you believe the final graph to look like. Uh, we have y, and there's some kind of square term. So maybe you would expect, and actually as we have, a parabola to show up. But um, it's not always that simple. And the reason why it looks like this is probably going to be a parabola, and then it indeed came out to be a parabola, has a lot to do with the fact that the expression for x is a linear function. If this were a quadratic or maybe a sine function, who knows um, what the graph would look like from this uh, parametric system. So don't always think that you're going to just glance at the y equals and kind of know what the final graph is going to look like. So the path that you get from this pair of parametric equations is forming a parabola, or in other words, y is equal to x plus 5 squared. And if you remember your transformations, uh, we're going to take our parent function of y is equal to x squared, a parabola opening up whose vertex is the origin, and shift it to the left through uh, five spaces because of the x, or, or because of the plus 5 uh, that's in this expression inside the main uh, sort of math operation of this equation, which is y is equal to something squared. So we're going to finish our graph paper here. 
And our, oh, chalk down our parent function of y is equal to x squared, which would look something like this, passing through negative 2, 4, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4, is going to get moved to the left five places. And our new vertex is going to be at negative 5, 0. I'll do a picture to make a different color. Negative 5, 0. And <clears throat> we're not going to focus too much on a really super exact graph, uh, but we're going to move left 1 and up 1 because there's no amplitude change, no vertical shift, excuse me, on uh, stretch <laughs> on this parabola. And moving, uh, moving left 2 and up 4, right 2 and up 4, we have a graph of our parabola. But this is not an appropriate graph to represent what's going on here with this pair or the system of parametric equations. The benefit of a system of parametric equations, one, you're tracking horizontal and vertical movement separately, which can have some good applications for physics, uh, can simplify some of your mathematics, but we're tracking the movement over time. See, this is the graph of just y is equal to x plus 5 squared. There's no indication of direction, and actually the fact that I included these arrows is a very bad habit, uh, because the arrows that are on a graph representing a system of parametric equations is not, is not only indicating the path of the travel, like you get from a rectangular um, system equation, but the direction. So we need a little t table here, and I'm going to let t equal uh, values, say, like negative 1, 0, and 1, and we're going to find values of x and y, and identify what kind of sequence those points are showing up in this parabola. So negative 1 times 3 is negative 3, and uh, negative 3 plus 5 is going to be negative 8. We have 0. We have 3 times 0 is 0 minus 5. We have 1. We have 3 times 1 is 3 minus 5 is negative 2. As we plug in the t value of negative 1 into my equation of y, I have negative 1, again for t, negative 1 squared is positive 1, and 1 times 9 is 9. We have 0 coming in here, which is going to give us 0. And we have negative 2 squared is 4, and 9 times 4 is 36. Now, t is equal to 1. 1 squared is 1 times 9 is equal to 9. That makes more sense. And so to the left 2 and up 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So my graph is not so great on this side. And so letting t equal negative 1, 0, and 1, moving through time from low to high, we go from the first point to the second point, indicating that our direction is coming down from the right, hitting that vertex, carrying back up again. And we have a parabola there, which we had, well, we could see that shape from the rectangular system, but now with a t table using the parametric equations, we have the direction of that path. And by the way, it is not always sort of this left to right like you would normally think. Um, a graph moves along a rectangular system, and that is the end of our first example. Example number two coming up right now. No, 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 no. Right after we talk about domain and range, this graph that we get from this system of parametric equations has a domain of negative infinity to positive infinity and a range for our y values that has the smallest y value of 0 and then the graph goes up from there so we're looking at 0 to infinity and I'm using uh, interval notation there you might be writing that the domain is uh, or the range is y is equal to or greater than 0 and x is greater than negative infinity and less than positive infinity. 
as your domain and range. Just use whatever notation your teacher is using. You'll notice too, by the way, that there's no visual per se. There's like an X and a Y axis and students are sometimes bothered by, well, where's the T at? There's no T axis. The T is showing up in how you're showing with the arrows the direction of movement through the path. All right, now, example two. And for our second example, we have x is equal to 3 cosine t plus 2 and y is equal to 3 cosine t minus 4. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to eliminate the parameter t and we're also going to sketch um, what the graph uh, looks like from these uh, two equations. We have a little bit of extra complexity coming on here because we're starting to introduce a little bit of uh, trigonometry to our work. But the fact that, uh, and again, the goal here first, we're going to eliminate the parameter t. So how would we do that? Well, we did the, next, we did the previous example through substitution, that technique we learned about uh, in how to solve system of equations in Algebra 1. We had linear combination and substitution. So we're going to y in terms of something in uh, x is what we want, meaning we need to eliminate the parameter of t in the equation for y. We have that parameter of t in the equation for x, and we have a really nice substitution. 3 cosine of t is in both of these equations, right? So does that really mean I need to solve this for t and plug it into here? No, you can simplify your work and just realize you need to, well, just isolate the 3 cosine t and you'll have a very nice substitution. We're going to subtract both sides by 2. see that we have this matching expression of whoops, 3 cosine t. So that entire expression, if you will, can come out. And in its place, uh, we put in the x minus 2. And we have y is equal to x minus 6. Pretty sweet. Now, this rectangular equation is a simplified version, if you will, of this parametric system. So what would that look like algebraically or, or, or graphically, excuse me? Uh, we have a y-intercept of negative 6 and a slope of 1. So this equation on our graph would be coming over here to y is equal to negative 6, so negative 4, 5, and negative 6. We go ahead and put our y-intercept there, and we have a slope of 1. And if all you do is see that slope of 1 and go, oh, this system of parametric equations is just forming a line, and you come through here and do this and call it a day and don't think about it anymore, well, then you've made a mistake. And actually, it's a mistake that I've done in class when doing this problem, even though I've done it multiple years in a row, and I'm just kind of... Not in a hurry, but maybe distracted or just not thinking straight. Um, that is not the graph that you get from this system of parametric equations. It's related, but this gives an incomplete picture. You can use the rectangular form to, again, allow you to see that path that you'll get from your system of parametric equations, but you don't get any sense of direction and the fact that there's no restrictions on t for this problem, by the way. A lot of times when you deal with trig functions, they'll tell you something like t is between 0 and pi or 0 to 2 pi. Here we don't have that. So what does the final graph actually look like with our um, parameter eliminated? Well, we need a t-table for that. So we're going to let t equal, and am I going to do like negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and all that like I did in the previous problem? Uh, no. I already know what the basic shape looks like. I don't need a ton of points to um, find out really just the direction of movement through our, func uh, through our graph. But if I'm going to be taking these values of t and plugging them into the trig function cosine, and I don't need a lot of points to see the shape of the path of travel, I only need an indication of direction. Why don't I pick some points that are easy? Like 
Well, I would even do like pi over, you know, 6. The cosine of pi over 6 is square root of 3 over 2. Why don't I pick some easy numbers, like when we did uh, sketching of trig functions, and do something easy like 0 pi over 2 pi and 3 pi over 2, and just for good measure, 2 pi, which hopefully you might realize is going to give a very similar answer, and use those values of t, those easy values of t, to find easy values of x and y. So when we take 0 for t and we plug it into cosine, well, the cosine of 0 radians is 1 times 3 is, uh, I don't want to move my hand up, times 3 is 2. Uh, try that again. The cosine of 0 is 1 times 3 is 3 plus 2 is 5. The cosine of pi over 2, now if you rotate pi over 2 or 90 degrees, the x or horizontal movement from the origin on the unit circle there is none. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. 0 times 3 is 0, plus 2. Now we're going to do, um, for pi, the cosine of pi is negative 1. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 plus uh, 2 is negative 1. And we have 3 pi over 2. The cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. Um, times 3 is 0. Plus 2 is 2. And just to make sure I'm not doing something silly here. And then finally, when we plug in uh, 2 pi, the cosine of 2 pi is 1. 1 times 3 is still 3. <laughs> uh, plus 2 is 5. Okay. Now, <clears throat> coming over here for y, we're going to click uh, substitute in the value of 0. Again, it's coming in for cosine, so the cosine of 0 again is still 1. Now we have 1 times 3 is 3, minus 4 is negative 1. We have pi over 2, the cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we're just going to have a negative 4. Cosine of pi is negative 1, times 3 is negative 3, minus 4 is negative 7. And we have at 2, excuse me, let's not make the same mistake again, at 3 pi over 2, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. Now it's times 3, which is still 0, minus 4. And at uh, 2 pi, we're going to be back at negative 1. So something interesting happens here when we start plotting these. The smallest value you get from cosine before, of course, you can, you can maybe multiply your answer afterwards, like an amplitude change on your graphing. But the largest value you get from cosine is 1. And the smallest value you get from cosine is negative 1. So we actually use some values that are going to give us the largest and smallest values of x and the largest and smallest values of y. Our first point on this t-table is at 5, negative 1. That was point number 1. Then we have 2, negative 4, so over 2, down 4. That was our second point on the t-table. We've got, uh, when t is equal to pi, we have negative 1, 7. So down, left 1 and down 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Looks like my graph is pretty good. And if we stop there, it looks like our indicated direction is down to the uh, left. But we're not done because we have no restrictions on t. This would be the graph if there was a restriction that t was between 0 and pi. We'd have the biggest uh, or far the, the point farthest to the right of 5, negative 1. The point farthest to the left is negative 1, uh, negative 7. And we went from right to left, and this would be our graph. But with no restrictions on t, and it just, you keep going, well, at 3 pi over 2, we're back at 2, negative 4. So we've traveled in the opposite direction to 2, negative 4. And at 2 pi, we're back to... Uh, 5, negative 1. So with no restrictions on time or t for this, there is not going to be any indicated direction because we're just bouncing back and forth between these two endpoints. So our graph for this problem is a little bit unique. And it looks like this. It's just a line segment, and it would be inappropriate at this one for this one to actually indicate a direction of movement unless your teacher is going to accept 
that at some point it's moving down to the left and at other times it's moving up to the right because you have like a, a back and forth motion uh, for the set of parametric uh, the set of uh, parametric equations. Example three coming up. Oh, 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 always forget the domain and range. Our <laughs> domain here is going to be values of x, and our smallest value of x is negative one, and our biggest value of x is uh, five. Interval notation that would be negative one to five, and if you are using uh, inequality notation, you're going to say that x is greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to 5. Our range values, the smallest y value included is negative 7. And the largest y value included is negative 1. And on to our third and final example. No, 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 no. If you just happen upon this question after doing those previous ones or a bunch of uh, questions in your homework that all look the same, uh, you're going to more than likely say, oh, well, I did everything else with the substitution uh, method for solving systems of equations. Let's just do the same thing here. Let's see what that looks like. Y in terms of X going through the variable of T. Well, you need to solve this for t and plug it into this equation. So we're going to divide both sides by 3. And at this point, you may go, man, this looks a little bit different than the other ones. Um, and maybe you just hopefully not this quickly admit that you're stuck. Uh, the more you flex those mathematical muscles and try and find your own path to the solution, the stronger you'll become mathematically. Uh, if you're really good in your, in, in your trig and all that was uh, going really well and you remembered it, from probably a few chapters ago, depending on what book you're using, uh, you're going to remember that, uh, as always, it doesn't matter if it's trig or just a square root function or whatever, whenever you are trying to solve for a variable and it's inside of another math function, you have to get it out of that math function by applying an inverse math operation. And I'm going to write it both ways uh, and then default to the, um, the notation that my current textbook textbooks use, but um, you're going to do an inverse, right? The, well, the inverse function for cosine is inverse cosine. So your book, and of course you, and you'll see this on your calculator, you can do the inverse cosine and apply that to both sides of the equation. Now, <clears throat> inverse cosine and cosine don't always just blatantly, you know, cancel out, but if the inverse trig function is out in the front, uh, that is what's going to happen. So the inverse cosine and cosine function, that is going to cancel away. Now, I promised you, and just said a second ago, that I would be writing um, this inverse cosine two different ways. So on the right-hand on the right -hand side here, we just simply have t, and on the left-hand side, another way of writing inverse cosine is arc cosine. Okay, so now we have arc cosine is equal to, arc cosine of x over 3 is uh, equal to um, so now we have, yes, the arc cosine of x over 3 is equal to t. I have t isolated and that allows me to do the substitution, recognize that yes, I have that variable of t in my other equation for y and do that substitution, which is going to yield us an answer of y is equal to 5, which my 5s often look like s's, so let me clean this up a little bit. And if your teacher's like mine, uh, and I, or like me, excuse me, and what I did for years, I might look at this and go, this is looking really nasty, I know what the final answer is supposed to be, and um, we're just going down a not so friendly path, but it's only not so friendly if you've forgotten all the trig that you just learned recently. Like, you know, what do you put into a trig function? You put in an angle measure, and what do you get out? You get out the sides of a right triangle, uh, the reference triangle. So when you look here and you go, okay, I'm done, well, you might be done, but there is a way simpler version of this equation, uh, one that you would be able to look at and immediately recognize and, and sketch what it looks like without the aid of a calculator. And in this format, there's no way you're doing this um, without the aid of a calculator if this is all you're looking at. So let's remember, what do you put into a trig function? Okay, this is the five times the sine of something. 
Well, that something that you're putting into sine has to be, well, what you get out of an inverse trig function. When you have an inverse trig function like arc cosine, you're not putting in an angle measure, you're putting in the sides of a triangle, a right triangle, and you're getting out an angle measure. So from this line, we need not five, we need y is equal to five times the sine of theta. We just have to know from the sine of theta, we have to know that vertical movement and that uh, radius or opposite over hypotenuse. We need, and I'm not sure how your teacher taught trig, but I hardly do anything uh, without a pitcher. We need a pitcher for this theta. What's going on here? Well, when you do inverse cosine, you get an answer that is between zero and pi, uh, zero and pi. Your restrictions for inverse cosine, when it's acting as a uh, function, the angle that you're going to get from inverse cosine is going to be an angle measure that's between zero and pi, while cosine, which is x over r, is negative in quadrant two, and we're going to just assume this is coming out to be a positive ratio for a simplified diagram. So we have this angle in quadrant one, we have this theta in a reference triangle drawn against the x-axis, and if, the, if this ratio is going into a inverse cosine, then this needs to be adjacent over hypotenuse, or a horizontal movement x over r. So the leg of this little reference triangle is x, the hypotenuse is 3, and with the little Pythagorean um, identity work, we're going to get a vertical uh, movement, uh, a, an opposite side to the angle of the square root of 9, minus x squared, because a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, so you can work that out. So now with the aid of a pitcher that we're getting from our understanding of inverse trig functions, we can say, well, the sine of theta, without even knowing what theta is, uh, is equal to the sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. It's a little confusing to say x, y, and r when I already have x's and y's floating around in my equation. So the sine of theta, this is so much fun. I can't, I used to, um, I can't believe for years I would look at this and go, there's an easier way of doing this and not review the trig that a student could use as an option of solving this. The sine of uh, theta is opposite over hypotenuse. Nothing wrong with admitting that you're getting better through the years of teaching. Uh, now that's a little bit ugly. We can multiply both sides by three. I certainly hope after 25 years I'm a better teacher than when I started or even when I started this YouTube channel uh, 11 years ago. Uh, then to, um, I want to get this into uh, a conic section type situation you're going you're to recognize here shortly. We're going to get rid of that square root by squaring both sides of the equation and getting 9y squared. If you're still hanging with me, I uh, really appreciate it. We're going to distribute the 5 through the parentheses. The squaring and the square root cancel out. Um, <clears throat> Don't forget though, square and square root act as an absolute value symbol, which sometimes we need to worry about, but uh, since this is basically effectively geometry and there can be like no negative distance, that wouldn't make any sense. We're going to multiply the 25 through, and I'm not going to actually do 25 times 9 because, well, I know what this problem is going to come out to, and uh, sometimes it's just better if you don't start multiplying things out because, let's, let's admit it, a lot of questions in your textbook are written to not all of them, but a lot of them to work out kind of nicely. Now you see where we have an x squared and a y squared. That's going to. This is either going to be a conic section, which is an ellipse or hyperbola. We're going to multiply. We're going to add the 25 x squared over to the other side. And if you just study conic sections, you know that your ellipses and hyperbolas need to be set equal to one. So we're going to divide both sides by 25 times nine, whatever that product actually came out to. And our final answer is x squared over 9 plus y squared over 25 is equal to 1. So this is uh, the system of parametric equations. I love this stuff. Um, 
you might think, oh, well, that like that first problem where we had y is equal to something squared and ended up being a parabola, maybe it looks, maybe you're thinking this is going to look like some kind of like weird sine or cosine wave, but no, in the interaction between both of these individually, it's a conic section, which is really cool. The ellipse is, uh, this is an ellipse, which has a uh, center of zero, zero. Our major axis uh, is going to come from this, uh, this denominator <coughs> of a squared, <coughs> which means a is five, and the major axis is going to have a length of uh, 10. And our minor axis, this is b squared, which is nine, so b is equal to three. And uh, so we're going to go left and right three units from zero. We're going to go up and down five units from, again, zero, because the center is zero, zero. And I've also written all over my graph paper. Uh, so let me get this out of the way. Get to use my super awesome graph paper maker on camera. Can't find these anymore. I even have one, and I can't find one online. And sometimes people online ask about it. Isn't that cool? This is the old school chalk. I've been using my iPad to teach from all year. This feels really good to uh, have a break from that and actually move around a bit while I'm teaching. Because uh, I granted this is virtual, but it's for a camera. Left and right three. Up and down five. And we have this, an ell this ellipse. That one more time is not the graph that is uh, representing this system of parametric equations. No, you again need one more thing. What is that? An indication of direction. So you're going to need to make up a little t-table, which I strategically left a little bit of room here. Just a few values of t, just enough to get the direction down. And uh, the cosine of 0 is 1 times 3 is 3. The <clears throat> cosine of pi over 2 is 0. The cosine of pi is negative 1. So 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And so we have um, taken a look at our values of y. 0 coming into here. 5, uh, not, too, not too quick there, Taru. Uh, sine of 0 is 0 times 5 is 0. The sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1 times 5 is uh, 1 or 5. Let's try that again. Chalk down. Boy, I'm breaking a lot of chalk today. Out of practice using the chalk. Uh, the sine of pi is equal to 0. So we're back to 5 times 0 is 0. And what's going to happen? We can get more points, but we just need that. We need to start seeing that movement. So we have 3, 0 was our first point. We have 0, 5 was our second point. We have um, negative 3, 0 was our third. And I'm pretty sure this would come out to be our fourth point. So we're moving around um, this elliptical path in this direction. Yes, we're done. Now, what I want to show you here is this is how you would need to attack this problem if you solve it in the same, same technique as we did our first two examples, and indeed probably most of the problems in your homework. But there's another way. When you're dealing with trig functions, and I'm sure there's other ones as well, but uh, you get to, the door opens up to some more, create. you know, you can be more creative in how you eliminate that parameter of t. In Algebra 1, you learn how to solve systems of equations using substitution and linear combination. Linear combination, where you added equations to make a variable go away. Well, if one equation has a cosine and one equation has sine, and if you think about maybe at some point adding these equations to eliminate a variable, do you remember anything that dealt with sine and cosine that had addition and the variable went away? like this Pythagorean identity. What was, the sine of, uh, what was the sine of t squared plus the cosine of t squared? 1, or it might have been a theta uh, when you learned the identities in the first place. So the Pythagorean identity is going to allow you to eliminate the parameter t. So what you want to do then with this in mind as a tool in your toolbox, um, eliminate the sine and cosine. Divide this by 3 and this by 5. So we have x over 3 is equal to cosine of t. We have y over 5 is equal to 
the sine of t. Now, sine plus cosine is not 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. So before you go try and to add these two equations to eliminate the variable of t, we're going to have to square both sides. We have x squared over 9 is equal to cosine squared of t. y squared over 25 is equal to sine squared t. Now we're going to add the equations together. We're going to add the left-hand sides and get x squared plus 9 over 9, uh, x squared over 9, plus y squared over 25. And then we're going to add the right-hand side. You see what's going to happen? We have, eh, we'll do the sine first. Sine squared t plus cosine squared t. We know that is equal to 1. And just like that, we have another trigonometric path to our final answer, which is one more time an ellipse with a minor axis length of uh, 6 and a major axis length of 10. But then we have to do that t-table to get the direction of path. We have a domain between negative uh, and positive 3. We have a range between negative 5 and 5. And I am Mr. True. Bam! Go do your homework.